Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our session. Uh, my name is Rahul Mehrotra. I'm a product manager at Microsoft Research Montreal. Uh, previously known as Maluba, uh, we were recently acquired, or over a year ago, acquired by Microsoft for our work in deep learning and reinforcement learning. Uh, so today we're going to talk to you about reinforcement learning, uh, some of the work we do there, and then my colleague Tamian Barnes will talk to you about um, hybrid reward, reward architecture, um, an algorithm that we use to beat the game of Miss Pac-Man uh, that was previously unbeaten. Uh, so what is reinforcement learning? Uh, you know, reinforcement learning is a data-driven approach to learning behavior. And the agent learns this behavior by interacting with its environment. Uh, so I have, over here I have a high-level uh, representation of the model where you have an agent and the environment. The agent takes an action within its environment and the environment observes that action and responds back with you know, um, what happened in the environment, uh, an update in the state, as well as a reward uh, for the agent. And that reward is really based on how good of an action was it that the agent took. If it's a good action, then it gets a higher reward. And if it's a bad action, it can lead to a zero reward or a negative reward. Um, and the problem here, and the goal of the agent is to really figure out how can it get both short-term rewards and long-term rewards. So its goal is to optimize for, optimize to maximize its reward as much as possible. And this becomes really challenging because the agent has to figure out, well, should I continue to explore and take actions that could lead to a higher reward? Or do I continue to take actions uh, that I know will guarantee me a short-term reward, but then doesn't really optimize for the overall, uh, overall reward it can achieve? So this is a really, really challenging problem in reinforcement learning. And if we can solve that, or when we solve that, then you can build some really cool applications and products on top of it. Uh, so for a couple of examples, I thought of, um, you know, we can really make an advanced proactive Cortana that learns from its environment, from its behavior by interacting with the user. And you can really customize it. It can get, get reward uh, back from the user, either by completing a task, task successfully or you know, through verbal commands that, uh, that the user might give back uh, to the agent. You can also build really uh, realistic NPCs or non-player characters in games where these characters have the intelligence to adapt to their environment and uh, adapt themselves based on the reward they're getting back. And then finally, something a bit mundane but maybe more relevant to the audience in this room here, uh, you can have automated code debugging and make our lives easier. Um, so, you know, over the last few years, there's been a lot of advancements in deep learning, but then over the last couple of years, there have been a lot of advancements in reinforcement learning as well. Uh, so a great example of that is, you know, uh, DeepMind teaching AlphaGo how to learn how to play Go from scratch using deep learning and reinforcement learning. Uh, there are a couple of examples at Microsoft as well where we have deployed some of technologies and products or, uh, you know, uh, our achievement with Ms. Pac-Man that Tavian will talk about. But if you look at these individual successes, you might think that, wow, we've made a lot of advancements in RL and we're really close to solving this really, really hard problem, but that's not really the case. Uh, so this diagram, I think, does a really good job of explaining where we are today. So the white circle is all of the instances of RL problem that exist, or all of the real world problems that we can model um, as an RL problem, which is quite a lot. And then the blue circle is, you know, problem instances where we've had limited success, where we're hitting that ceiling or wall that we can't really push through today until uh, we come up with new techniques. And then finally, you know, you have uh, this really small red circle where we've had um, really good success. Uh, we've built stable and efficient solutions. And a great example of this is uh, Decision Service by Microsoft that leverages, uh, you know, this ability to, where the agent only needs to worry about the next step and the next action it needs to take and the next reward it's going to get. So it's not really concerned about the long-term reward at this moment. If we could solve these problems, uh, or even if we, you know, our long-term goal at my Microsoft or Microsoft Research Montreal at least is to build, uh, you know, a general purpose RL algorithm that can take, tackle much more complex tasks, it's much more sample efficient, and it's much more stable. And if we can solve these problems, and we can hopefully take that red circle uh, and really try to expand it uh, as much as possible. Uh, so I'm going to show you, uh, this was just a quick intro to RL. I'm going to show you a quick video of uh, 
the technology behind Ms. Pacman, and then Tavian will walk you through, do a deep dive into uh, uh, the code itself. Video games are one of the best ways to demonstrate advancements in AI, as they require human-like intelligence to perform well on them. Maluba has developed an advanced reinforcement learning algorithm that beat the Atari game Miss Pac-Man and achieved the maximum possible score of 999,990 points, surpassing the best human score by 4x. No human or AI has ever achieved this score because of the complexity of the game and availability of limited lives. We perform well on the game by breaking it into many small problems with a separate reinforcement learning agent for each problem. On screen, we have a total of 163 agents, 154 for pellets, 4 for ghosts, 4 more for edible ghosts, and 1 for the moving large fruit. Each agent also has its own reward function. We give a small reward for eating a pellet, a large reward for eating a fruit or a blue ghost, and a large negative reward if Miss Pac-Man gets eaten by a ghost. At each moment in time, all agents send their action preferences for the current game state to an aggregator which selects the best action for Miss Pac-Man based on a weighted average of all preferences. By breaking up a problem in this way, it becomes easier to learn, as there are now many agents that learn many simple tasks instead of just one agent that needs to learn a very complex task. Here, the arrow represents the direction the agent wants Miss Pac-Man to move, and the size of the arrow shows the strength of its preference. The strength of the agent's action preferences are also visible on the heat map. Beyond Miss Pac-Man, this fundamental advancement in reinforcement learning can improve decision making in complex settings such as sales funnels, financial models, or robotics. All right, uh, so for the rest of the session, Tavian will walk you through hybrid reward, reward architecture, uh, which you know, takes a really large complex problem and breaks it down into a lot of smaller problems. And then these agents individually uh, work together to communicate to a higher level agent, which uh, finally makes the decision. Tavian? Thanks, Raul. So yeah, uh, my name is Tavian Barnes. I'm one of the engineers at uh, Microsoft Research Montreal, formerly Maluba. Uh, and I worked a lot on this project, uh, mostly towards the end when we were actually tackling uh, Ms. Pac-Man proper. Uh, but I'm actually going to walk you through the, basically the whole history of how we uh, came at this problem initially, um, and over you know, the course of a year, a year and a half, we were able to, to make significant progress on it. Um, so I'll, I'll start out with just a little bit of an introduction to uh, our reinforcement learning team. Uh, at the time um, that we started working on these kind of tasks, uh, there were only two people. Uh, so there was Harm, and there was Mehdi, uh, and there was an intern, Josh, who was with us for about a year. Uh, and we were really interested in uh, scalability of reinforcement learning. So that means uh, the ability of uh, algorithms to tackle uh, problems that are harder or bigger or have a, you know, a larger state space or more complicated uh, uh, functions to learn. And uh, the initial idea that uh, the team came up with uh, was something we called uh, separation of concerns, or SOC. Um, and we had good results uh, on this with uh, a few little toy games and, and problems that we, that we gave it. And the idea was, was basically you know, the, the fundamental CS idea of divide and conquer. Uh, so when you have a really hard problem, you know, some game or other task that's very hard to learn, you might want to break it up into chunks somehow. And if each of these chunks is easier to learn and the solution to each of these chunks contributes uh, to a solution to the overall task, then you know, maybe you can make some headway there. Um, and the SOC paper led into another paper, uh, multi-advisor RL, and, and finally HRA, where we got our big results on uh, the actual uh, Ms. Pac-Man game. Uh, but so to start out with SOC, uh, the idea that this paper explored was looking at uh, various ways that you can break down a single task uh, that would like, normally be represented by a single agent uh, and break it down into multiple agents and various architectures for doing that. So do you want the agents to be able to talk to each other, uh, or do you want them all to output some sort of, uh, you know, their own action and then, and then pick the best one somehow from that, or do you want them all to communicate with maybe like an advisory agent that uh, takes input from all the other agents? And uh, 
uh, determines which uh, suggestion is the best. So this diagram sort of uh, explains this, where there's, there's a few different possibilities. You know, in A, uh, you have them all, all the agents communicating with each other and then outputting their own action preference that you select from. Um, in, uh, in B, the, the agents are still communicating with each other, but you sort of select one as the leader, and its action is ultimately the one that gets chosen in the environment. Uh, and then the last thing I talked about is C, where you have sort of a, a, an aggregator node or a head node that is taking all these suggestions from the other agents. And in this example, the agents are actually not communicating with each other. So they're just focused on uh, their own subset of the problem. And then the aggregator has to learn uh, how to determine you know, whether the input from agent one or agent two or agent three is more important at any given time. And uh, uh, so there's, there's various reasons that you might think that you know, you, any of these approaches would do well. Uh, and depending on the task, they can. Uh, but we basically found that the you know, architecture C, the, the one on the right, gives the best results. Uh, and there's a few reasons for this. Um, and mostly they are to do with behavior that you see where uh, each agent is, is only looking at maybe a subset of the problem. And uh, sometimes because it's only seeing a subset of the problem, it thinks, well, you know, in my subset, there's very obviously a best move. Right? And if each of the agents has a different idea, of what the, what the best move is because its, uh, its view is sort of myopic, uh, then you can end up in the state where you, the agents sort of become attractors, where uh, you may move towards the preferences of one agent and then suddenly start moving towards the, precedence, uh, the preference of another agent and then to the third agent and then cycle back to the first agent and you can sort of move around the map or, or whatever your environment looks like and not make any real progress uh, because the, the agents collectively can't really decide on what to do. Uh, so that's the importance of sort of this, uh, this aggregator. Um, so you can see here we just have a, a few examples of some tasks that we uh, applied this SOC model to. Um, you know, Pong on the right and uh, you know, something that kind of resembles some of these old-fashioned old video games. Um, in the other cases, a simple little navigation task around a, a map with walls. And uh, yeah, and so we got, we got some pretty good results, but the, these are not on, uh, uh, you know, production-grade problems. These are on uh, simple problems that we were experimenting with. Uh, so then our next step was basically to take the, uh, the experimental results that we got with the SOC paper and come up with uh, uh, more of a theoretical underpinning for why those behaviors happen. So if you're interested in some of the, uh, uh, the theoretical uh, or the mathematical insight behind uh, the behavior of, of the different ways that you can do SOC, I highly recommend uh, checking this paper out, the uh, multi-advisor RL or MAT RL paper. Um, and we basically prove a few criteria on uh, you know, when you can expect these attractors to exist or not, and uh, uh, the kind of behaviors that you want from your individual agents uh, when you are breaking one problem up to be solved by multiple agents. Um, and so we started here with uh, uh, sort of a simulated game um, that we call Pac-Boy, or the, the fruit collection task. And the idea is to have a, a, a much more constrained game than, than the actual full game is Pac-Man, but it still resembles it, and basically all the behaviors that you might want to learn, uh, you know, in the real game, we think you can, you can try to learn in this game, but, uh, you know, a bit quicker, but just because of the, the more constrained size. Uh, so the animation you're looking at here is actually uh, what deep Q learning does on, on this game. Uh, so this isn't HRA yet. Uh, this is sort of like the conventional you know, state of the art or you know, standard baseline model that people use for tasks like this. And uh, the interesting thing that we're illustrating here is now it kind of gets paralyzed and stuck in a corner. And it's, it's too afraid of the other ghosts, uh, the, the red dots that are moving around trying to eat it, to make any progress and actually complete the level. Uh, so that's a behavior that we've had to contend with and, and find ways to get around uh, at various stages throughout this project. Uh, so we'll just keep that in mind for later. We'll come back to it. Um, so I actually want to uh, switch over for a minute. And I'm going to show, so you saw that there's a, a GitHub link here. And uh, if you guys are interested at all, uh, you can check this out. And I'm actually going to. Uh, show you some of the stuff that you'll see in this repo. 
And so if you, if you want to reproduce any of the results that we had on these tasks, uh, all the code is there um, for the, the Packboy task. And, uh, and you can you know, clone that onto your computer and try it out. So if I just switch over to my laptop for a second, uh, I'll show you the, uh, the Packboy game. So you can play it yourself. So here's sort of the very, very constrained model where there's no walls, and I can kind of just move around the map like this. Um, there's also uh, you know, more complicated maps. Uh, so if I do this uh, small as opposed to mini, then you'll get the, the map that we were kind of showing in the, in the slides, and you can try that out. Uh, and so I actually trained an agent this morning just to double check that everything uh, is still working the way that I expected to uh, on the small one. So I'll show you a demo of that running. Uh, so here is an agent that I trained with HRA this morning, attempting to uh, just solve the very basic version of this fruit collection task. So it does pretty good. So I, I talked about uh, a couple of problems that, that we saw in our earlier experiments. So I talked about the attractor problem, where you can end up with uh, uh, you know, sort of too many competing influences, and your, your overall agent can't decide what to do, how to balance these various inputs. Uh, there's also the problem of your, your agent being too fearful, so where it's afraid of the, the, uh, the ghost or any, any possible negative rewards, and that prevents it from actually you know, completing the game, solving the level, collecting the final reward, because it's too afraid of, of dying. Uh, but there is a happy middle ground. And, uh, and we found that middle ground finally after, after about a year of work. And we applied that uh, to solving the harder problem of the actual Miss Pac-Man game. So here's the final paper, uh, which was presented last year, last December, at uh, NIPS. And uh, yeah, this was a really big moment because it basically confirmed that all the work we were doing on these uh, sort of scaled down problems, you know, it actually does generalize to these bigger and harder scenarios. Um, so why, why is Pac-Man important? Like why specifically were we looking at this game? Um, there had been a lot of other work. So uh, you know, in the years before this, uh, there was a work by, by DeepMind that had uh, sort of one architecture that learned to solve a lot of these Atari games. So there's like an Atari benchmark set with a, f a few games in it. And this, uh, this one algorithm, this A3C algorithm, did, uh, did pretty well on, on the collection of games. But some of the games you know, it found harder, and some of them it found easier. So I'm not sure how well everyone can see, but in this graph, we sort of have a stack of uh, uh, which games the, uh, uh, the, the A3C did really well on at the top. And at the bottom, it's games that we didn't do very well on at all. And the line in the middle is sort of where uh, the AI is you know, at human parity or better than human parity in, in that uh, experiment. And then everything below there is where uh, you know, the AI didn't reach human parity at playing these video games. Um, and so I mean, this is another example of where like, RL is actually a hard task. And you'd think that maybe you know, video games from the 70s and 80s would be, would be something that we could just trivially, trivially solve. But you know, it's not really the case. Some of these things are actually hard. Uh, and Ms. Pac-Man is somewhere near the bottom. We're about fifth, fifth or sixth from the bottom there. So you know, it, uh, it really was not an easy thing to learn for the existing state of the art at that time. And uh, so there's a few reasons that the game is hard. Um, one is that just the, the state space is, is actually gigantic. Uh, now, to a person, it sort of looks like a, a very simple game. Um, but you know, we have a, lo a lot of our own intrinsic biases and why we think that this is simple. Uh, it's hard for an AI to learn all the ways that we generalize you know, looking at this and coming up with, like, oh, well, you know, all, the, uh, all the pellets are kind of the same, so I don't really need to, to know too much about the pellets you know, separately. Um, but the, the total state space is actually gigantic. It's, it's you know, bigger than chess. Um, so you have to come up with some way to, to mitigate that. And uh, the other problem is that the value function is not smooth. So there's, uh, there's states that may look very similar, um, but they have a very different expected reward. Uh, so a couple of situations that this can happen are things like where 
uh, there's, a, there's a threshold where the a ghost may be too close to you and you can't run away. So if it's just over this, thre this threshold, you're going to lose the game. You know, there's nothing you can really do. Whereas if it's just behind that threshold, then maybe you can do some, some nice maneuvers and, uh, and escape from it. Um, so these kind of uh, uh, very steep changes in the value function mean that it's, it's hard to model it in a, in a low dimensional representation. It's hard to simplify that value function down to something that you can you know, learn with a, a reasonably sized neural network. So we applied HRA. Um, and HRA, in this case, is like a, uh, an extreme amount of uh, you know, decomposition of the problem. It's an extreme amount of divide and conquer. So if, uh, specifically, what we had was we had one agent uh, learning how to handle you know, every uh, sort of pellet-sized chunk on the map. Um, so there's an agent you know, voting for the best behavior kind of at every fixed position on the map that you might see. And then there's also agents that are uh, sort of attached to the ghosts uh, and one to the character itself that, uh, that learn, you know, the, the ghost agents hopefully learn that you should be avoiding the ghost, move in the other direction away from it or, you know, away from where it's moving, that kind of thing. Um, and then we learn all these agents uh, separately and we can combine their results into something that can, can actually beat the game. Uh, so I'm going to get a little bit technical, uh, just because that's kind of a, a high-level overview of uh, 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 what HRA is about. Uh, so this is, is going to be a very low-level thing, but I'll, I'll try to connect it to uh, uh, you know, real-world concepts a little bit so you can follow, even if you're maybe not familiar with all the math behind reinforcement learning. Uh, so the standard setting for reinforcement learning in, uh, in problems that are fully observable, so where you get to see the entire state the whole time, like uh, most board games and, of course, most video games, uh, is that you think that the underlying world you're trying to learn about is a Markov decision process. So you think that the underlying world uh, is in a particular state, and uh, uh, you can know what that state is, and you can take actions in that state, and based on the actions you take, the world is going to transition into some new state. And the transitions that happen depend only on the current state that the world is in and uh, uh, not necessarily on the history. Although if you have some sort of scenario where the history is important, you can maybe just model the history, the relevant parts of the history anyway, as part of you know, the state. So it's, it's a flexible enough representation to capture a lot of real world problems. Um, you know, everything from video games to like, uh, you know, trying to train self-driving cars and stuff can be formulated in this way. Uh, so you have your state space that you call S. Uh, you have an action space uh, that you call big A. Um, and this is just the set of moves that you can take in your environment. So for video games, it's usually pretty straightforward. It's just you know, all the directions your joystick can move and all the buttons that you can possibly press on your controller, this kind of thing. Or you know, for a PC game, maybe all the ways you can move your mouse and, and all, the, all the keyboard keys. So uh, in, the, in some of these cases, it can be fairly limited. Um, in other cases, it can be, uh, you know, you have a very large action space and you might want to decompose the action space itself. And so that's, that's the area of some other uh, approaches to scaling reinforcement learning is kind of on breaking down the action space. Uh, so options does that, for example. Um, but we, we kind of focus on breaking down the state space or actually uh, more accurately, we focus on breaking down the reward space. Uh, so we've talked about these positive and negative rewards and uh, that's kind of, very key to uh, reinforcement learning. Um, and it's kind of how a lot of people think of uh, you know, how people learn, or how animals learn at least, uh, where you know, your, your child or, or your, your pet does something and it's, it's maybe going to get a positive reward, you know, positive feedback encouragement from you, um, or maybe it's going to get a negative reward. Maybe you're going you're gonna to say, hey, that was a, a bad thing to do. Don't do that again. Or maybe it'll be some intrinsic negative reward, like it hurts itself and it learns not to do that kind of thing again, right? Um, and uh, uh, another thing that sort of separates RL from, uh, from other forms of uh, uh, machine learning is that uh, you are working in a world that is changing all the time. Right? So you don't get to look at a whole bunch of data ahead of time and uh, uh, try to learn off that. You have to operate in the, in the real environment. And uh, uh, you know, if there's something you need to learn from that environment, you have to do it quickly because the, the worse you do in this environment, you know, the worse off you are. Um, 
So anyway, uh, in the discrete case, we break down the problem into a series of time steps. And at every time step, you look at what the current state is. Uh, you decide on what action you want to take. And you get a reward back from the environment. So the environment reward function, uh, Rn there, uh, tells you, you know, basically whether that was a good or a bad move. And uh, the details of how that reward function behaves can be, can be important, because some rewards are much harder to learn than others. Uh, uh, sparse rewards are the hardest to learn, right? So that's where maybe you only get points after you complete a game and not for any of the individual subtasks. And if you can push some of those points sort of earlier so that when the agent does something that uh, you, know, you think is, is probably a good thing for it to be doing, if you can get the, those, that reward you know, earlier in the process, it becomes a lot easier to learn. So anyway, after you take an, an action in the space, you receive a reward. You also get to see what the next state is. Uh, and this can be uh, non-deterministic. It can happen according to some probability distribution. Uh, or it, you, know, you can have fully deterministic systems. And it happens that Ms. Pac-Man actually is fully deterministic. So um, uh, if you're in a given state, uh, you know the position of everything, you, you can actually learn to predict uh, what the next thing is going to be. We didn't happen to do that uh, for our, uh, in the setting because we learned in a model-free way, but uh, it is hypothetically possible. So anyway, a couple, couple more items of terminology. Um, in reinforcement learning, you hear about policy functions a lot. So your policy is basically the ultimate thing that you're trying to learn in reinforcement learning. Um, your policy is given a state, what action should you take in that state? And you can have a deterministic policy where it always you know, is, is just selecting one action. Uh, but in the more general case, you can learn a probability distribution over your actions in any given state. So you can say, oh, I think there's a 90% chance that we should take this action, and maybe a 10% chance that we should take this action that I think is, is maybe slightly worse, and then I'll assign you know, 0 or 0.01% 0 .01 or something to the, the other actions that I think are, are pretty bad in the state. And uh, you want to find a policy that's good in a particular way. And the way that's usually written is you want to maximize the discounted sum of rewards over time. So that's the infinite sum of, uh, of the rewards that you get at every time step. Um, and you, know, every, you have that, uh, the gamma to the, the i in there, which is uh, basically a discount factor that uh, controls how important it is to get rewards now versus getting rewards later. Um, so you know, as you go further and further into that sum, uh, you know, gamma between 0 and 1 uh, will get smaller and smaller. So if you have gamma close to 1, then long-term rewards can be you know, maybe sort of close to as important as short-term rewards. Whereas if it's, if it's small, then you're really maximizing for your sort of immediate gains. Uh, all right, so just a little bit more. Uh, technical stuff. Um, one extremely popular way to do reinforcement learning is called Q-learning. And uh, in Q-learning, what we're trying to do is we're trying to basically learn to estimate that sum that I had on the previous slide. Um, you want to learn a, a quality function for your policy that says, uh, you know, given that I'm acting with respect to this particular policy, and I'm in the state, and I'm going to take this action, what is my expected uh, total reward uh, over the rest of the future acting according to, the, to this policy? And uh, so whatever action that uh, happens to, you know, in any given state, whatever action happens to maximize the, your Q function is going to be sort of your best action. So that's like if I take this action now, and then I follow this policy for the rest of the game, uh, what's my expected score, or what's my expected total reward? And there's a lot of different Q functions corresponding to the vast array of different policies that you can have. And one, because there's a bunch of them, one of them has to be the best, right? So we call that one Q star, and that's the optimal quality function. And uh, so we're just maximizing over all possible policies and trying to learn, uh, you know, if, if I took any policy, What's the best that I could do in this scenario? And if you can learn to compute Q star, 
then you can sort of go backwards from that and determine what the actual best policy is. Because the best policy uh, is going to be selecting greedily the best action at every state, according to QSTAR. So if you have a good uh, representation uh, or a tight enough approximation of, of QSTAR for your real environment reward, then just greedily selecting the best action at every step will get you the optimal policy pi. Uh, and I say here that this solves the RL problem in a model-free way. Uh, so there's a difference between model-based methods, which are methods that try to learn the underlying uh, Markov decision process that's, uh, that we think is representing the environment. Uh, but there's also model-free problems, where, or model-free solutions, where we don't actually learn anything or very much about the underlying MDP. We just learn how to take good actions with respect to that MDP. Um, so it's a little bit less to learn because you don't have to really figure out the details of how the world actually works. You just have to figure out, OK, what's a, what's a good policy for taking actions in this world? How can I do well? So with that, we get into the actual definition of HRA. So uh, Q star can be a very complicated function. And it's not always easy to learn, even with something as powerful as deep networks. So we want to chunk it. We want to break it down. And the way that we do this is we say, OK, the reward signal can have a lot of different, uh, different parts to it, different components. And sometimes it's obvious how to break this down. And so in a game like Ms. Pac-Man, it's fairly obvious where the reward signal can come from a lot of different uh, parts in the game. So every time you eat a pellet, you get a certain number of points. Right, so that's, uh, that's a lot of different components already if there's something like you know, 160 pellets. Um, you know, then each of those is a separate way that you can get a reward. So that's a separate component of your reward function. Uh, you can also die by getting attacked by a ghost. Um, and so that's another, another way that your reward can be assigned to you is, is through the ghosts. And the ghosts are sort of independent of the pellets. Right? So the, the ghosts follow you around the map. And uh, uh, your interactions with the pellets don't really control uh, whether or not you're going to get eaten by a ghost. So it's a nice separation, fairly clean. Uh, and there's also a few other components, like the, uh, the big fruits that give you bonus points. And uh, there's the special pellets, the power pellets, that uh, let you start eating the ghosts. So that's how we broke down Pac-Man specifically. But in the general case, HRA is just taking any way of decomposing the reward function at all. Uh, and some will be better than others. But to formulate it, we just take any way of decomposing it into a, a weighted sum of components. And then you do the same thing to the quality function that I talked about previously. So instead of having one Q function uh, that tries to estimate your you know, total reward based on a particular policy, uh, you try to have a bunch of independent Q functions that try to estimate just the total reward according to that uh, component, the corresponding component of the reward. And then uh, uh, you add them all up with the same weights as you did the reward, the environment reward, and that gets you the Q sub HRA function. Um, now, why does this help? Well, basically, if you've simplified the problem at all with this decomposition, if each uh, reward component is, uh, maybe it depends on a smaller amount of the state space, or maybe it depends on the state space in a simpler way, maybe a linear way as opposed to a nonlinear way, et cetera, uh, then each uh, Q function, each Q component function, can be easier to learn. And Optimizing the sum of all these component Q functions uh, doesn't actually necessarily converge to the optimal policy with respect to the environment, but it basically gets you fairly close in, in a lot of scenarios. And because it's learning so much faster, uh, it's, it's sort of better than doing, the, uh, doing it in a way that, that you know, would theoretically eventually learn uh, because you, know, you can learn now and you can learn a policy that is way better than you can uh, possibly learn according to traditional Q-learning over you know, any time scale. Uh, and it also is the case that if you have a particular policy, uh, so once you've decided on a policy, you know, your, your Q function for HRA uh, is the same as the environment Q function with, for that policy, and that just comes from uh, the linearity of expectation and the definition of, of the Q function. All right, so that's all the math. Now let's get into some of the results that we got 
on the game itself. So we did all this complicated stuff. We broke the problem down. There's a, a lot of you know, extra information that we're providing, you know, uh, segmenting the uh, game state into all these individual components. You know, each of the separate pellets is fed to it separately, each of the positions of the ghost and the character and all this stuff. And we still didn't really do that well. So uh, you can see that we kind of you know, hover somewhere around, you know, we're above zero. But we're not even we're not even in at a thousand points really, and we kind of plateau at that point. Um, and what's happening there is that uh, uh, we're a little bit too afraid to try new things. So it, we basically think that we've solved it, even though we haven't. We think that oh, this is about as good as I can do. Uh, I'm not going to try new scenarios. I'm not going to uh, try to start the game any differently than I did the last time because I know I can get at least this many points this time. So. Little tweak to control for that, which we called safe random start. Um, and so in here, actually, we just added another, uh, you know, reward component function that's actually literally just a random number. It's just assigning random weights uh, to all the possible actions in every state. Uh, with, you know, uh, there's pretty constrained. So we're not trying to, if, if we think the rest of the system has learned good things to do, we're not trying to override that with a random result. But uh, you know, near the beginning where we don't really know what the best course of action is, uh, this is helping us generalize, uh, or is helping us explore, and it's helping us uh, uh, learn quite a bit better. So we do the safe random start, and uh, suddenly we're getting around 10,000, or plateauing maybe around eight or 9,000 points uh, on the game, which is cool. But it's not really enough. Um, so the next thing we did is uh, we applied a certain amount of normalization. So one of the problems that, uh, that we talked about before was this issue of when you reach near the end of a level, uh, the agent becomes too afraid of the ghosts to make the necessary progress to actually complete the level. And this is sort of a tough problem because at the beginning of the game, you don't want uh, you know, each pellet to have too much influence over the agent's behavior uh, because there's so many more pellets than ghosts, right? So those weights need to be tuned so that uh, uh, at the beginning of a level, it's not, uh, you know, it, it fears the ghosts appropriately and, and doesn't, uh, doesn't do things that are too dangerous. But once you reach the end of the game, uh, now suddenly, you know, the signal coming from the pellets is not strong enough to overpower the fear of the ghosts because you only have two or three pellets left or, you know, five or ten. Uh, and with the way that the weights were, you know, at the start of the, the level, uh, it's not really conducive to actually trying to, you know, dodge the ghosts and find those pellets to complete the level. So we applied normalization where we put the ghosts at a, a separate level. So the total influence of the ghosts and the total influence of how the pellets, however many pellets are left, uh, stays roughly constant throughout the progression of the level. And that lets us uh, do a little bit better. So you can see here that, uh, uh, that we eventually you know, get three or 4,000 more points than, uh, than if we were just doing uh, uh, you know, the non-normalized way with the safe random start. Uh, and it, it looks like from this graph, actually, that uh, uh, the, the previous line, the orange line, uh, initially learns faster and then kind of plateaus, whereas the green takes longer to, uh, to learn, but eventually learns better. That's not really the case. Uh, it's a little bit. Uh, misleading because the x-axis is uh, games played or, or you know levels completed basically and uh, the orange line is spending so much more time on every level because it's so afraid to actually go out and, and get pellets that uh, if you looked at like the number of frames that you've taken you know we're able to learn way quicker with this green line and the last thing that we did was we incentivized exploration a little bit um, so this basically involves uh, adding another agent that uh, gives, estimates a somewhat strong reward for situations that it hasn't seen before. And, and this leads it to a little bit more exploratory behavior. You know, if it, if it sees something that, uh, oh, I've never tried doing this particular move, or I've never tried, uh, you know, maybe like taking that loop off the edge and coming back, it's going to try to do that and learn what happens. And uh, uh, by exploring more of the state space, you can, of course, find ways to do better at the game. And so when you do more exploration, 
uh, you know, it's, it can be riskier, but you can also be rewarded by finding you know, better passive play, better policies, and better actions. And in, in this case, yeah, we did significantly better once we added this uh, dedicated exploration as well. So by the time we play 1,000 games or so, we're up to something like 16,000 points. And if we keep going, we get up to somewhere around 25,000 points before we hit what we think of as a, as a plateau. So here on this graph, we're comparing against uh, A3C. That's uh, uh, the standard kind of uh, benchmark or, or baseline approach to games like this, um, uh, asynchronous advantage actor critic. And uh, so there's two separate lines for, for A3C. There's A3C pixels, which is the red line. And so that's the traditional uh, uh, A3C approach where you just feed it the, the each frame, you know, the frame images of the game one after the other, and it learns how to play based on that and the, the signal coming from the, the ultimate score. Um, and then there's A3C channels, which is uh, basically our attempt to get a little bit more of a fair comparison with HRA. So because we did all this pre-processing on the input signal, um, chopping it up into these chunks and letting it know explicitly, you know, these are the positions of the ghosts and, and this is the position of Pac-Man, this kind of thing. Um, we wanted, for a fair comparison, to provide that to A3C as well. And you'd think that this ex extra information would be able to make it do better. And it does do slightly better, but it's basically within about the same range. Um, so, so maybe somewhere around you know, 2,000 or, 2, or 2,500 points that it uh, kind of plateaus at. And it, you can see it's, it's still sort of jumping around. It hasn't really uh, converged on any uh, particularly great line of play. And so that's, that's pretty interesting. So that sort of signifies to us that the hard part of solving games like this is not you know, learning uh, how to interpret the images or learn how to interpret the video and, and stuff like that. The hard part is really once you can interpret that signal, uh, how to represent uh, the state space and the rewards in an effective way that you can actually learn. And even, even breaking the problem up like that is, is still... Uh, your problem is still very complicated, and A3C basically can't learn it to nearly the same degree that we can uh, by applying HRA. Uh, so I'll show you the numbers in a little bit more detail. Um, so here's how we compare to uh, what at the time were, uh, were all the major results on this game with various methods. So uh, uh, human is at the top, so that's, uh, that's not like the best human score ever, but that is, that's like an average competent human at the video game can get somewhere around 15,000 points. Um, if you behave completely randomly, you don't do very well, you get maybe a few hundred points. Uh, and you actually see on this table that there's two evaluation metrics. So there's fixed start and random start. Uh, so because Ms. Pac-Man is a deterministic game, um, there's a lot of uh, memorization that you can do. Right, so once, you, once you've seen a scenario in a level, you can kind of memorize, oh, I should do this in this scenario and do pretty well. So you see that a lot of these methods, uh, they can do very well in this fixed start scenario because they can basically memorize um, you know, how to play certain lines of the game. If you feed them a random start, which is actually just accomplished by uh, you know, doing a few random actions at the beginning of the game before you hand control over to the agent, so that randomizes the position that it's starting from. Uh, you see that, that most of these methods pretty much fail to generalize. They'll do you know, maybe half or a third as well as they do in the fixed start scenario. Uh, whereas, if you look at the very bottom row, not only is HRA actually beating the score of all these other methods, but we're extremely similar performance between the fixed start and the random start. So we think that this means that we've, we've successfully learned to generalize um, in a way that other methods haven't on these games. And uh, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's cool. You know, we beat human performance and we beat all the, all the other algorithm performance, uh, but it's not a million points, right? So there's one more thing that we did to get to a million. And that's something that we called executive memory. So the analogy that I, I like to use for this is uh, if you play a video game a lot, eventually, uh, you know, certain certain tricks and, and things will, will get committed to muscle memory, you might say, right? Where uh, you've seen the scenario before and you know that, oh, I just hit you know, left and A or something really quickly and I can do this jump. Or you, know, you memorize exactly how to get the, the, the double jumps and it becomes everything becomes second nature, right? Um, so 
for the, the fixed start case, there's a lot of opportunity to do this. And you could try to memorize, once you, once you learn how to beat a level, uh, you can memorize, hey, if, if I'm gonna play the game again, next time I see this level, I know that this sequence of actions was good. You know, uh, I know that if I've ever seen this particular state before and, uh, and I made this move, I didn't die at the end of the level. You know? So the executive memory agent that we added basically remembers any actions that you take in a level uh, that ultimately result in you not dying in that level. And then the next time you play that level or the next time you see any of those states that it's seen before, it assigns a strong positive reward to playing those actions in those particular states that it knows you know, could lead you out of that level successfully. Uh, so when you do this, you don't generalize as well, or you basically don't generalize at all because uh, you, you know, in a random start situation, you don't expect to see exactly the same state very often. But uh, in the fixed start metric, it basically lets you do extremely well. And you can see that we, we pretty much never stop learning. There's no plateau. You know, we're able to get to extremely high levels in the game, and we're able to get to an extremely high point total. So somewhere around 270, 280,000 is the, the best human high score ever on this game. Um, and if we play somewhere around you know, 2,100 times, we beat that and we're still shooting up. And we actually get all the way to a million points or a million minus 10, and the score counter rolls over at that point. Uh, so we pretty much, that's, that's as good as you can do. You know? um, and if you wanna see the moment where that first happened, um, Here it is. Zero. So it's a little bit small, but you can see the score counter is somewhere in 99999, and it rolls zero. back over to zero. So that was a cool moment for us. Uh, as soon as we saw that, we basically knew that uh, a lot of the work that we were doing over the zero. past year had, uh, had paid off, and we had a new algorithm and a new method zero. that was able to solve previously unsolved problems and do it in zero. somewhat dramatic fashion. So. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Uh, I hope you're uh, a little bit more illuminated about the hybrid reward architecture and the various approaches that we took to arrive there and uh, about reinforcement learning in general and how cool of a space it is and the progress that we hope to make in the future. So with that in mind, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so the question is, we, we reached the maximum score, um, but uh, have we done more work to see if we could uh, get to that point faster or you know, uh, further improve the efficiency? Uh, and the answer is, I don't think we really have explored that too much. Um, there's probably a lot of, of you know, a few more tricks that we could do, uh, but we basically wanted to you know, do as little uh, you know, work as possible right, like as, as little hand tuning of everything. So there's maybe some extra tweaks that we could apply that would get us there. Um, but uh, the only way that we're gonna get there significantly faster is some you know, even newer, more fundamental RL algorithm. So we, we sort of think about these things, but yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we were thinking about that a little bit. Um, so the, uh, like I said, the code is, is on GitHub, and you can, you can take that, and uh, uh, it, it implements a lot of variations of HRA, and so you can plug your own problem into that and try, you know, tabular HRA or HRA with uh, uh, generalized value functions, you know, HRA with, uh, with deep Q networks uh, or without. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's sort of the level at which we've, Made, made that available. Do you think uh, executive memory has any relationship to like transfer learning? 
so the question is, uh, do I think executive memory has any relationship to uh, transfer learning? Uh, by the way, if you feel like coming up and using the microphone for these, then the recording will catch them a little bit better, and I won't have to repeat everything. Um, it's up to you. If you're in the front, don't necessarily bother. Uh, so transfer learning, uh, the, it sort of has a relationship in that it makes transfer learning harder. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the executive memory relies on, on basically you know, hashing the state and seeing exactly if I've seen this state before, I know what to do. Uh, so it, it decreases generalization and the, your ability to transfer that knowledge over um, a little bit. Uh, actually, yeah, applying or being able to do uh, transfer learning uh, with respect to HRA is, uh, is another area that might be interesting for research um, because uh, uh, with the way that you decompose a problem, uh, that may be harder to generalize across problems. So the exact decomposition you use for something like uh, Pac-Man you know, is probably not going to make sense for any of the other Atari games. And so it's even harder to sort of like share something like weights or, or share knowledge across. Um, but it's an interesting area. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, so I was curious if uh, while you were um, you know, programming the game and it was getting better and better, did it ever play in a, like an alien way um, that you know, humans don't normally play? Like for instance, the AlphaGo, uh, and I'm just parroting back what I read, I don't really understand how it worked, but was um, playing Go in a way that no human had ever played before. And I guess that the champion Go master actually studied some of that and he started using it against other humans and he started winning, right? Um, did you notice any of that kind of behavior? Um, you know, I mean, when you get to 500,000, you're already twice as good as a human. Is it, is it just going faster, or is it actually? Uh, no, that, that's a very good question. And uh, you're right, a lot of the, uh, the new strategies that uh, were pretty much invented by AlphaGo um, were, were very fun to watch. And it was very cool to see like, a, a computer come up with new ways to play a, a game that's old like that. Now, I will say I don't think that Miss Pac-Man has kind of like as deep a strategy as you can have in Go. Um, so even though it's got like, you know, on the face of it, it's got a, a, a somewhat larger state space, um, or probably comparable, I actually don't, don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Um, there's, not, uh, there's not an excessive amount of, of like strategy you can learn. So the, the most alien thing that uh, you'll sort of see it do is, uh, uh, well, A, it just has way better reflexes than, pe than people do. So once you see the higher levels, um, the game is moving incredibly, incredibly fast, and uh, HRA has no problem keeping up, whereas, uh, a uh, human would, would be pretty quickly overwhelmed. Um, but you do see uh, occasionally uh, behaviors that you might consider weird, and I'm not even sure that these are, are optimal, but they're definitely good enough to get to a high score. Um, but sometimes you'll see it sort of looks like it's on some particular path. Maybe it's trying to get to the, the power pellet in the corner, and then it'll just suddenly decide not to. And I'm not sure exactly why it does that. Maybe it, uh, the ghosts move in a certain way, and it realizes, oh, I can't really make it there anymore. I got to do something else. or uh, Maybe it's sort of a horizon effect where it sees like, uh, oh, now that I'm now that I'm this close, you know, I, I'm observing something that I didn't observe before. The weights have changed, and uh, and I realize that that's not actually my best course of action. So, yeah, it's tough to say. I, I don't think we've done any like deep analysis of uh, the the ways that it actually plays the game. But good question. Thank you. Uh, so you said that you added an agent to incentivize exploration. Yes. A and that. Uh, when it had seen a position that it had seen before, then it might try to do something else differently this time. But mm -hmm. if the state space is so huge, how are you recognizing that this is a place that I've seen before? Is it actually just, oh, here is this one in 10 to the 50th states, here's another of these 10 <laughs> to the 50th states? Uh, yeah, so as, as far as I know, I'd have to, to double check the implementation exactly, but uh, my understanding is that it's uh, uh, basically only useful near the beginning of a level where there's only a few states that you can kind of possibly be in. Uh, and then after a while, uh, you know, there's, there's kind of too many states and everything is going to be exploratory. So it's sort of trying to in incentivize early exploration just by, uh, by doing that. Um, yeah, you talked earlier about how you added a random randomization agent. Yep. But then uh, later on through your path of kind of exploring and learning how to make this thing better, you added agents. Um, like he mentioned, for exploration and normalization. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go back and try removing the randomization agent to see if that made an improvement or if it was still necessary once you'd kind of introduced some randomization via the other three agents? Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I, we probably did, and my guess about what would happen 
is that uh, once you have, uh, once it, uh, the model has a fairly good understanding of the mechanics in, in the beginning of the level, uh, then all of the predictions that it makes uh, are strong enough to sort of overpower that uh, random agent suggestions. Uh, so I think you know eventually after you do a certain amount of training, if you remove the random agent, you're not really going to see any difference in behavior because uh, uh, we're more confident in uh, the other agents are more confident in our decision. Uh, so it seems like one of the like major like magic ingredients that kind of brought everything together uh, for you on top of everything else was adding that executive memory. Uh, is that something like a solution that you had kind of prepared really early on in your research to maybe add in or is it something that you more came up on the fly when you encountered you know kind of problems like breaking these scores and do you have any insights on why that might have been so successful for this sort of game? Yep. Um, yeah so we we added it fairly late actually so you know in terms of the uh, progression of the slides that course kind of corresponds to the progression of reality where we had that 25,000 score and we were looking at okay how do we break this plateau uh, you know what ideas can we take advantage of and uh, to do that so in terms of why executive memory really helps it's basically just uh, uh, primarily due to how deterministic the game is and uh, uh, the fact that like if you learn uh, if you learn a trajectory that will beat a level, uh, then you may not necessarily have learned the best one, but if it, if it happens in a reasonable amount of time, then you can, you can spend more effort learning you know, how to beat the higher levels. So uh, your, the, the tractability goes way up because once a level is solved well enough, uh, you can spend, you know, suddenly you're spending 90% of your time learning how to solve the next level. And then once, once you learn that, you spend most of your time learning how to solve the next level and so on. Um, and uh, uh, whereas without it, uh, you kind of are spending you know, a little bit more effort, you know, on the, the earlier levels that you've already seen before. Um, just sort of, you're, you have to do more effort to, to play through them well and to make sure that you're, you're not falling into traps and stuff. So. In, in my limited experience in RL problems, there seems to be a bit of an art to it. <laughs> yeah. Could you uh, just describe how you would think about generally approaching a problem and breaking it down using using HRA as far as you know how do you divide um, the agents and such? Yeah, yeah just in a general sure. sense. No, you're, you're definitely right that uh, the HRA is uh, a, is a little bit of an art. Um, or sorry, that the reinforcement learning is a bit, a bit of an art in general. Um, we still struggle with stability a lot, which means uh, uh, you, know, you may train uh, using some algorithm once and it may, it may work, and then you use a different seed the next time and it may not work. And you don't really see that in, in like traditional deep learning where sort of you can start from any random place and, and always converge. Um, so yeah, RL is a little bit, little bit harder in this way. It's a little bit more uh, you know, un unstable. Um, so in terms of... Uh, my advice in applying something like HRA or any of these like hierarchical decompositions of uh, of the RL problem in general is uh, well, first of all, you don't have to go as crazy as we did. So even if you just decompose your reward signal into maybe like two or three components, that's still an exponential savings in terms of the the complexity of the actual Q functions that you can. Uh, that you're trying to learn. So even if you have a problem where like, oh, you know, the reward really comes from like two different parts of the, of the system, even just doing that breakdown can be enough to, uh, to provide a tremendous amount of benefit. Uh, and the other thing is just uh, be uh, smart about how you do the decomposition. So, you know, there's, there's almost an infinite number of ways that you can break apart, you know, any reward function into a, a sum of other reward functions. Uh, but the, the best ways to do it are uh, ways where each component is is similar or is uh, simpler rather in uh, in a particular way so it depends on less of the state or it depends on uh, you know the state in a simpler way or it's it's somehow isolated from the rest and so if you if you just break it up in a random way you probably don't uh, make it any more tractable there has to be a little bit of thought there uh, now eventually we would love to be in a situation where we can uh, uh, you know, automatically discover these ways of partitioning the problem, um, but but for now, yeah, let's do it by hand. 
Uh, can you use HRA to problems where the evaluation function is some real-world uh, process, so you need to minimize the number of epochs, you cannot run it so much times, or is it not suited to, to this kind of problems? Um, so that's a very good question. Uh, and I would say that for uh, a lot of real-world problems that we're dealing with now, um, just, just HRA will not really be enough to save you. Uh, and we actually are doing a lot of active research in this area as well at MSR Montreal, um, and we're, we're, we're calling it uh, uh, safe reinforcement learning. So in other words, we don't, uh, trying to avoid uh, doing dangerous things in real environments where that might uh, penalize you. So obviously self-driving cars are like a, a big example of this, but also uh, we're ultimately trying to apply RL to dialogue. And uh, so while you might learn a lot if you sort of like make up a random sentence that doesn't make any sense, you might learn that, okay, that didn't make any sense. Um, it's a real negative experience for an actual human user if you go out and, and do that. So there's, uh, uh, there's various ways that you can try to uh, do safe exploration and, and also off policy learning, which means like learning from examples where uh, you know, you, you've already acted in a certain way and trying to learn as much as you can from those without uh, actually, uh, regardless of whether those follow your, your current policy at any given time. So you mentioned that it took you guys a year to go from the point where you could um, like stop, avo like avoid um, the misfaction getting stuck in a corner to finally finding that balance between um, the like knowing to go after the pellet and make progress even though it would like put it t closer to the ghost. Um, mm -hmm. Why did you guys avoid just like touching the reward function and just saying like, hey, just tweak up um, the, like the reward of the pellets to go higher and like, or the, the distant, like the fear of the ghosts to go down? Um, yeah, because we sort of felt like that would be cheating a little bit. Okay. Um, uh, in, uh, people will call that reward hacking or various other things. You're sort of like, you know, trying to tweak the, the reward itself. Um, now, a certain amount of, of that I think can be good, but uh, uh, we really wanted to approach it from sort of a more fundamental level and really get a theoretical understanding of, of why do these behaviors happen and how can we, uh, you know, ensure from a theoretical standpoint that we're not going to run into these, uh, these situations rather than just, uh, you know, there's certain things you can tweak. So, for example, you can, uh, we have a little uh, theorem that says you can always tweak that uh, gamma parameter in the discounted reward sum to avoid uh, having attractors. Um, but we'd rather have an algorithm that can learn regardless of how you set your gamma so that you can use it for what it's designed to be used for. Right? Thank you. You're welcome. How important to the agent was the actual layout of the maze? If you gave it a random one each time, would it just be lost or did that factor into it? Uh, that's a good question. Um, there are, so there's only four different mazes or, or maps in Ms. Pac-Man, the Atari version anyway. Um, and uh, it does basically learn them all. So the, it, it, you can definitely see that like once it has, uh, you know, solved level one pretty well, its, uh, its performance in level two is, is not going to be as good until it also learns that map. Uh, so there's, there, there's an amount of generalization, but there's, there's also an amount of uh, it having to, uh, you know, explore and do different things on, on different maps, different mazes. Uh, now, I, I think maybe part of that is sort of from the way that we uh, pose the problem. So we actually are doing things like uh, dynamically discovering these, uh, these, the new agents that correspond to the pellets, like when they get eaten, right? So uh, when, it, when it sees the, a new map for the first time, it really has a lot less knowledge about it than like a person looking at it would. Um, and we force it to learn the maps through exploration. So potentially, uh, you know, if we didn't do as much of that, maybe we could do better in terms of generalization. But we, I mean, for this game, we didn't really have to just because of the limited number of maps. Thanks. I think you mentioned uh, earlier in the talk that um, you were avoiding uh, games, and uh, you, that's why, why you picked Miss Pac-Man, uh, that didn't have history. Um, did I, maybe I misunderstood that, that there wasn't like a historical component, or maybe it was the Markov chain you're starting um, at me like I'm a crazy person, so I must, yeah, no, I must have missed no, a bunch of uh, things. Uh, it, it, I was thinking like you, um, like a game like Jenga or something, where you know each brick is pushed out, 
there's a historical you know thing to win the game. Right. right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So when uh, yeah. if you're thinking about when I was talking clear. about uh, uh, modeling the world as as MDPs um, and how you you need to be in a situation where the uh, behavior given the current state and an action is totally independent, uh, oh, it's like conditionally yeah. independent of the history. Gotcha. Um, but uh, you, a lot of things are like this, even if you don't expect them to be. So if you think of something like Jenga, it doesn't really matter what uh, you know what sequence of moves were were made to get the tower in a particular state. Like if you can look at exactly what the what the state of the tower is, you can basically you know simulate the physics of it. Something like that. So, something. Um, so a lot of games uh, will have this property, and you can almost always formulate it in this property by sort of like cheating and just adding the history as a part of your current state if you have to. Okay. And then uh, the last question is: uh, um, Would you recommend any books or articles or something to learn more about uh, um, reinforcement learning? Uh, yes. Um, so actually, uh, the. There's a, a book by Richard it. Sutton that's sort of, I think it's just called like Introduction to Reinforcement Learning. Okay. Um, that's, that's probably where I'd recommend starting. Um, if you come up to me later, I can pull up uh, some other examples from okay. our, uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I think Microsoft may have some uh, uh, so. in informative resources online and stuff as well. So. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Well then, uh, Thank you, everybody, very much for uh, paying attention to this presentation. It was great.